Well, I was just remarking with a friend a moment ago that the hard part of the service is over. Getting all the kids' names right, getting them all dedicated and participating in that. Now we get to dig into the Word of God together. If you're new, if you're just joining in with us, if you've been, uh, not been part of the church family, if you're here for the first time, we are in a series called Colossians, The Fullness of God. Uh, looking through this ancient letter, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a small church in a little out-of-the-way town in what's now modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, a town called Colossae, uh, to encourage them in their faith. He'd never been there. As far as we know, never would go there, but he wrote to them to encourage them. And we take a lot of encouragement and instruction as a church in the 21st century from this letter written to a church in the first century because we do believe God's word is living and active. The tagline for the series is the fullness of God. I remember doing a funeral just a few weeks ago for a, a, a friend whose father had passed away. And he remarked to me standing in the lobby as people were filing in for the service that he was grateful his dad had lived a full life. I knew his father, and I think that's true. But I thought about that phrase, he lived a full life. You've probably heard that or said that about people from time to time. What does it mean to live a full life? What what constitutes a full life? Great career, kids, grandkids, big house, enough, enough in your 401k to pass on. Like what's a full life? What makes it a full life? Lots of friends travel the world. Lots of stamps in your passport. I mean, what would you put down and say, my list for a full life would be X. I mean, nobody wants to live an empty life. Well, perhaps you might say, actually, my life is full of a lot of stuff, but I don't feel very full. I feel stressed. So maybe full life would be like having the right things in your life. What does it take to live a truly full life? And what role does spirituality or faith play in living a full life? I think many people in our culture would say, yeah, it's it's good to have faith. It's like an add-on to my already the list of things that I'm, I'm building my life on. A little Jesus in there would be helpful. I've said this many times before. There's no such thing as a little Jesus in your life. He's not little, but he wants to be your life. Many people today, I think, are looking beyond the church and the faith of their upbringing. I hear this all the time, that I need, I need something more. There's like, the faith I grew up with, the church I grew up in, my parents' faith, it's not enough for me. I, I'm bored with it, or it's, it's, uh, it's become insufficient, and I'm looking for something more or looking beyond. Deconstructing, we hear a lot of, and reconstructing a faith based on what I desire, what I want, what I'm looking for. Each of the last two weeks, we saw the Apostle Paul write to Colossians, and in different ways, he's saying that there is, the fullness of God is in Christ. There's no other place to look. In fact, we challenged you last week to memorize Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. I'm sure you've all got it nailed. So let's stand together, and one at a time, we're going to, no, just kidding, right? <laughs> but, but seriously, let's stand together, and we'll recite it here. It'll be on the screens for you. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and through him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, either in earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. You may be seated. Paul wrote that to the Colossians, an ancient hymn they would have known by heart, like the theme song, making Jesus the theme song of your life. We talked about that last week. Memorizing it, not because it's the, the point is not your ability to recite it perfectly, but the repetition, as Paul will say in Colossians chapter three in a few weeks, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Repetition is good for us. There's a reason you can remember the theme songs from TV shows from your youth. You've heard them so many times. But what if we let the word of God get into our minds and hearts this way because we repeat it over and over again about who he really is. And the theme of, uh, to put it in a statement, the theme of the series is the fullness of God is in Christ and we are to be filled up in him. The fullness of God is in Christ and we are to be filled up in him. 
So what does it mean to live a full life? It's in Christ. It's to have him. Everything you need for a full and complete life. Not a life free from pain or difficulty or hardship or disappointment, but a full life is you already have if you're in Christ. There's no going beyond him or around him or above him. There's just Christ, Paul says. It's a great reminder. This is Paul's approach to talking to the church, including us, about how to stay focused. When there's all these competing messages in the culture about what you need, what you lack, what you should long for or look for, something else, rather than chase down all those false ideas, he simply brings us back again and again. No, what you have, you, what you need, you already have. The fullness of God in Christ. The passage we're going to look at and unpack today, Paul describes his ministry and his mission and his goal for the Colossians. His prayer for them, like what, he's, what his purpose is, what God's purpose is for them. We'll read through the passage here, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 24, to chapter 2, verse 5. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In him we proclaim, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. <coughs> okay, there's a lot going on here. Based on this incredible declaration of who Jesus is, verses 15 through 20, our memorization passage, Paul is telling us what he's all about, what his purpose is. In other words, if Christ is preeminent, the firstborn of all creation, if he's supreme over all, then my whole mission is about him and making him known, he's saying. We see it here in these first verses. Let's go look at verses 25 through 28 here. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. In fact, you see this here. Paul's telling us, among another, many things, what he's about. To make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known, again, there it is, making known. God's doing that through Paul and through others. How great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone. So there's warning and teaching that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So what's Paul about? He's saying, look, here's my goal. Here's my mission. I want Jesus to be known among you and among the whole world. I want to proclaim him and him alone. I want you to grow up, become mature in him. That's my whole mission. That's what I'm all about. Let me put it this way. Paul's mission is to make Christ fully known among the nations and to help those who believe in him to reach full maturity in Christ. This is what he's about. He's writing this from a prison cell. So what can he do besides pray and write? That's his labor. That's his struggle. He's praying fervently and writing to encourage them. Deep desire for them to grow up in Christ and for all people to know of God's love through Christ. I, I often reflect on this and think, I, I admire and uh, wish I had Paul's laser focus for his life. Like just this crystal clarity, I am about making Jesus known. What are you about, Paul? Are you about making money? Are you about making a name for yourself? Are you about making your mark on the world? No, I'm about making Jesus Christ fully known in the world and those who believe in him to help them grow up in him. That's it, period, full stop. And I think about that, like you, you might say, well, 
Like my son is a plumber's apprentice, my youngest son. Is that his mission in life, to plumb? <laughs> no. To honor God, to live out a life faithful to Jesus Christ. His occupation is a plumber. To do that as one fully devoted to Jesus. So your, your, your geography, where you live, your occupation, what you do, those are gifts of God. He's placed you there. Do them with, with great energy and integrity and passion. But is that your life's mission? To build your nest egg? To build your business? Or is it to make Christ known in how you behave and how you live and how you treat other people, how you run your business, how you lead your family? So Paul's saying it's so easy to get distracted. As a church, it is too. So Jenny just said it a minute ago. There's a lot going on around here. There's a lot of stuff happening. And it's easy to get off track and think, well, all this stuff is, is just for us. No. To see our life right as a, as a family of God, Chapel Street Church, is to understand that our, our core mission is to make Christ fully known and to help those who trust in him to grow up to maturity in him. All the activities if you boil it down, are about those two things. So let's look at the ministry of making Christ fully known. The ministry of making Christ fully known. Paul's ministry and ours as well. Now most of you would agree, I hope, that it's a good thing that people know about God's love through Christ. No, many of you, I'm, I'm gonna guess most, if not all of you, would say, yes, I want people to know about the love of God in Christ Jesus. That'd be a good thing for people to know that. And that's easy to say when people agree with you when the culture is sympathetic toward the Christian worldview, when those around you, if they don't believe everything you believe, in general they, they have a, you know, a high view, a positive view. But what if they don't? What does it mean to make Christ known? I remember one time when I was younger, we were doing this evangelism training, and the training was to knock on people's doors and ask them, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you'd go? Well, if somebody my size knocks on your door and says that, that sounds mildly threatening. I don't think that's a very good approach, right? If you were to die tonight, do you know where you'd go? But like, 911. Right? That's not what it's talking about. He means to make Christ known in, in how we live our lives. Well, our words, absolutely, when opportunity arises. Not to beat people over the head with the Bible, but to live in such a way that they would want to know. I want to know what she has. I want to know what makes him tick. There's something different. There's a joy. There's a peace that undergirds their life. Where does it come from? To make Christ fully known. Look at verses 24 and 25 again. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. There's a, there's, a, some, a, there's a lot in this that, that, that is a little bit confusing. Paul in verse 24 says, I rejoice in my sufferings. In verse 29, he says, I toil and struggle. In chapter two, verse one, he says, I have a great struggle. So there's a lot of toil, struggle, suffering Paul's talking about. But what in the world does it mean when he says, filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions? Does that strike you as odd? Anybody hear that and go, what does he mean? What's lacking about Jesus Christ suffering on the cross? Didn't he hang on the cross and say, it is finished? Wasn't his death sufficient for the forgiveness of the sins of the world? Do I have to add anything to that? Don't we say frequently around here, like you can't earn salvation, you don't deserve it, it's a free gift? So what does he mean, what's lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, he doesn't mean to accomplish salvation. Jesus did that at the cross. What he means is making that known making what he accomplished known in the world. Martin Luther says it this way, it would not matter if Christ died on the cross 1,000 times if no one ever heard about it. Live as if Christ died on the cross yesterday, rose from the grave today, and is returning tomorrow. And wear a cool hat. No, that's not. In other, words, in other words, the suffering and afflictions and struggle and toil Paul talks about is not to accomplish salvation, but to make it known. To let people know there's a cost to that sometimes. He's in prison writing this letter. So at what cost? Jesus has fully accomplished your salvation. Now he asks us to share it, to let people know it. 
Carl Henry said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Paul's saying essentially this, if it takes my suffering and my struggle, and if it costs me something to, for people to know about the amazing grace of God in Christ Jesus, then I will joyfully pay that price. Persecution is coming for the Christians of Asia Minor. In just a few years, the region of the Lycus River Valley where Colossians was in Laodicea, which is mentioned in the letter, being a follower of Jesus is going to cost them something, going to get uncomfortable. I would just think it's a question worth pondering. What price am I willing to pay to make Christ known by the way I live my life? God has made known his plan of salvation in Christ and he's making it known in the world through his people. Next, the mystery of God fully revealed in Christ. You probably heard that word mystery a number of times in the passage when we read through it. Uh, and I think there's, it's a bit problematic for us because we think of mystery, well, I, I don't know about you, maybe generationally, I think of the mystery machine, Scooby-Doo and the mystery machine, that goofy van, you know? Or maybe you think of Sherlock Holmes uh, or, you know, it's, it's a clue or riddle to be solved. Or sometimes we use the word mystery to mean like, you know, you just can't know it. It's a mystery. Can't know it. That's not at all what the Bible means by this word mystery. Let's read the passage here, verses 26 through 27. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles. By the way, this word Gentiles here is the Greek word ethne. We get our English word ethnic from it. It just means nations. It means anybody who's not a Jew. Everybody else, the whole world are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is an amazing couple of verses. So the Greek word mysterion is, is, is not mean, does not mean like a, a riddle you can't solve or some coded message. It means something hidden now revealed or intended to be revealed. Something veiled now exposed, now seen. A secret made known. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 reads, These people of faith of the Old Testament died in faith, not having received what was promised, but seeing it from afar. In other words, they, they knew about God's promise to redeem and to restore and to save, but they never saw it in their lifetime. They saw it with the eyes of faith. It was to them something of a mystery, not fully revealed. Paul is saying to these Christians in Colossians and to us, it's fully known now. That which God always intended to do has been revealed in Christ, his plan of salvation. God's plan of salvation is not a timeline of events or a coded message. Sometimes I think we approach the Bible like, there's a code I have to decipher, and only the smart ones or the ones who have the secret knowledge get it. That's not at all what he's saying. I've made known to you what I always intended to do through the giving of my son Jesus, to give his life for the redemption of the world, for the forgiveness of sins. God's anticipated, longed for, and now revealed plan of salvation for all people through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Everything God planned to do, now made known and fulfilled in Christ. For all people. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3, all nations will come to your light and kings to your brightness. Isaiah 55, verse, three, verse 5. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation who does not know you will come and bow before you. It's always been God's intent. I think sometimes we can read the Old Testament, if we read it at all, and think, well, he's just about the Jews. But from the beginning, he calls the people to himself, the Jews, not because they're special, but because he chooses through them to make known his mercy and his grace and his love, ultimately leading to Jesus. That's been his plan. From the beginning, and Paul's saying, it's here, it's there, it's revealed. Look no further. That's what he's after. Notice also what Paul says about the personal nature of this. So he says that this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Paul will frequently talk about being in Christ, this union we have with Christ. Here he flips it around and says, Christ in you. No other world religion talks this way. The Buddha does not indwell Buddhists. Muhammad does not inhabit the hearts of Muslims. But the great promise of the gospel is not Christ ahead of you or behind you or above you or even next to you, but in you. 
So not only does he die and rise from the dead to forgive your sin, he dwells in you by his spirit to empower you and to liberate you. In other words, the message Paul's saying to the Colossians is, if you want a full life, the power to live a full life comes from Christ in you, not from your strength trying to measure up to his standard, not from your wisdom or your intelligence or your ingenuity or your creativity, but from all of that in him who is in you. We just recited Colossians 1, 15 to 20, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things. And that same Jesus is out there in you, if you've trusted in him, in you. That's why it matters that we understand this. Not a little extra, like a little spiritual inspiration now and then, or a life coach to come alongside us and help clean up our act. But the power of the risen and reigning Jesus living in you. That's what he's saying to them. All other prepositions don't get it done. Jesus with me is nice. I'm glad he's with me. Ahead of me, certainly, that is an example. Behind me to support me. Beside me. But in me. Do you believe that? You live like that's true? Paul talks about this indwelling of Christ with his followers 216 times in the New Testament. The mystery of the gospel is that Jesus Christ not only forgives and redeems, but comes and resides in you. And that's the beginning of a new life with him. And this brings the last point, the goal of reaching full maturity in Christ. The goal of reaching full maturity in Christ. When I, when I was, uh, well, this happened more than once, but when I was a junior in high school and then again in college, uh, I, I was, um, you know, I could grow a be- facial hair early and I looked more grown up than I actually was mentally or emotionally for many years. Maybe that's still true, quite frankly. And I can remember my dad one time pulled me aside and said, Jeffrey, it's time for you to grow up. And he didn't, wasn't talking about physically. I was already bigger than him physically. He's talking about, you know, in here and in here. There's a place in 1 Corinthians 13 where the Apostle Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I talked like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish things behind me. It's time to grow up. I've told the story many times, like childish ideas, right, are cute when you're five, six, seven, but at a certain point, they're not cute anymore. Like one time I was tucking Noah in bed when he's a little guy. He's, he's now almost done with law school. He's 26 years old and, and 27, excuse me. Anyway, holy cow. Right, anyway, um, and he's got his, uh, his superheroes lined up on his headboard, little figures. And he asked me, Dad, who would win in a fight, Superman or Batman? Well, Superman would win, so he's a man of steel. Batman doesn't even have powers. He just has a cool, cool belt and a cape. So I had thought this through, right? <laughs> Dad, who would win a fight, but Spider-Man or Superman? Well, that might be closer, but Superman will win. He's still the Man of Steel. So he went down the list in line, asking all the people. Then he said, Dad, who would win a fight, Superman or Bible Man? Do you, do you know Bible Man? Do you not know Bible Man? It's like the cheesiest superhero ever. <laughs> Willie Ames played him in some ridiculous show in the, like, the, like the early 2000s. Anyway, then he had a Bible Man figure because he's a pastor's kid. Anyway, <laughs> and I, he said, who would win a fight, Bible Man or Superman? I'm like, well, they wouldn't fight. What if they did? Well, they wouldn't. Well, what if they did? Well, ah. Uh, Bible man would win. I had to, I, I, what can I say? I'm a pastor. I can't say he'd lose. Bible man would win. Okay, okay. Then he said, Dad, who would win in a fight, Bible man or Jesus? Well, they wouldn't fight. What if they did? Jesus would win, son. Jesus always wins. That's an important point. Okay. So I'm like, well, do you just go to sleep now, right? And then he goes, then he goes, Dad, who would win in a fight, Jesus or God? Oh, it's like 930. How do you explain the Trinity to a kid, a five-year-old kid? I'm like, they wouldn't fight. Well, what if they did? They wouldn't fight. What if they did? I said, it would be a tie. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else to say to him. And he, so he thought, oh, okay. Well, Dad, uh, a tie like they both give up or they both get knocked out? That's what he asked me. I went, I, ask your mother. <laughs> okay, that's hilarious for a five-year-old kid. But if I, as your 50-year-old pastor, I'm up here talking like that, you're like, you need to go back to school, right? There are certain ideas you've got to grow out of, Right? But I think the temptation in our culture today is to think, grow out of everything. Oh, that's my parents' belief. That was a church of my youth. I'm, I'm, I'm beyond that now. 
I'm, more, I'm smarter now. That's kid stuff. Paul is saying, yeah, yeah, there are some things you need to grow up and grow out of, but not Christ, not the Christ of the Bible, not Jesus as he's revealed to us. You must hold on to him if you're going to be mature. If you're really gonna grow up, never let go of him. You cannot be mature in Christ if you're gonna let go of who he says he is to you and reinvent him based on your own ideas. We have some growing up to do. I do and you do. Look at verses 28 through 20, or Ephesians 4, 13, excuse me. We have that one. Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is Paul's goal for us to reach maturity. And going back to verses 28 and 29. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul says it's not enough for you to pray some prayer once upon a time at vacation Bible school or when you were a kid or to vaguely believe in God because you go to church once a month. I want you to grow up in him. Become mature in him. More and more have Christ Jesus as your, the theme song of your life and your, the mission of your life. It plays itself out in different contexts because we have different roles in the world, but we're about him. That's spiritual maturity. Not new ideas, not reinvention, but him. In the last few verses of this passage, Paul describes to us what that's supposed to look like. I think this is, will be really helpful. Verses two through five of chapter two. So that their hearts may be encouraged Hearts encouraged is the first thing. Being knit together in love and to reach the riches of full assurance of understanding. Three things here. First of all, encouraged hearts. Spiritual maturity is about growing and encouraging one another. And, and to, to encourage, we, we think encourage means just to say nice things. You look great. Nice job. You know, you smell nice. Like, I don't know. That's not what encourage, in, to encourage is to give courage, literally. To strengthen in the faith. And then he says, knit together in love. To be, to be united together. This is crucial. You will not grow in spiritual maturity on your own. You will never reach maturity in Christ by yourself. It's not a solo pursuit. You need other Christians around you. That's why we talk about our rooted groups and our life groups and why it's so important that you don't just attend once in a while, but you're in community with other Christians and the word of God is central and you're praying for each other and challenging each other and encouraging each other, knit together in love. And then he says, reach full assurance. Full assurance of what? I think it's a mistake to think this means there's no more questions, no more doubts. No more issues we don't, haven't resolved. The older I get, the less black and white I am about many, many things. But the more certain I am about him. That's what Paul's saying. It doesn't mean you don't have questions. I think part of being mature is recognizing those things I used to be dogmatic about aren't that important anymore. But I'm more and more assured of who he is and what he's done and what the gospel is. I'm building my life on him. I'm betting my life on the resurrection we said a few weeks ago. He's the solid foundation. I don't have all the answers. There's a lot of things I used to be, I was sure about. Now I, want, I might rethink and wrestle with, but not Jesus, not the cross, not his resurrection. Of that, I'm more and more confident than ever. I think that's what Paul's saying. And you don't get there on your own. You don't get there in isolation. We get there by helping each other, encouraging each other, knit together in love. Paul says it right here. In him, in whom are hidden all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's all in him. Look no further. And then, then lastly, verse four through five, Paul says, I say this to you in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. That word plausible in Greek means fine sounding. For though I am absent in the body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. This is the first of a bunch of times where we get this uh, reference to somebody who's not named but seems to be bringing in some false teaching to the Colossians. We'll get there next week. Paul says, I'm telling you this, why? So that you will not be deluded, led astray, confused, deceived by stuff that sounds good but isn't 
focused on Christ. I'm telling you all this why, because I want you your whole life long to grow in the certainty of the knowledge of the wisdom of God in Christ Jesus. That, friends, is the full life. You, you might have an empty bank account. You might experience deep pain and discouragement and tragedy. You might have loss in your family, but you can be full to overflowing in Christ. Whatever comes, that's what Paul's saying. To these, he's writing it from a prison cell. He knew hardship. And many of you have as well. But the full life, the truly full life, is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this ancient letter which is speaking to our hearts if we're paying attention. Thank you for your wisdom that the true riches and knowledge of who you are has already been made known. We don't have to decode something or solve some riddle. You have made yourself fully known through your word and in your son, Jesus. And Lord, we, we struggle with answers to questions we can't, we can't figure out, but we can be certain of who you are in Christ. I pray that you would help us as your followers encourage each other, be knit together in love, and grow into full assurance and maturity in Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Some of you wanted to clap right there. That's okay. You can. It's all right. And we don't applaud for the performance, though it's beautiful, but for the truth the song contains, because all we have is Christ, and all we need is Christ. So brothers and sisters, go in his name, the one who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, knowing that your hope, the hope of glory, is Christ in you. Amen. And go in peace.